The icy rock peaks of Mount Kenya pluck at clouds high in the atmosphere. Plants and animals living here face a daily battle with the elements. On the Great Plains below, the age-old struggle that determines survival of the fittest unfolds. All are part of a unique and fragile ecosystem that depends on Mount Kenya for survival. of the Great Rift Valley is the Lycipia Plateau, home to more mammals than anywhere else in East Africa. Stories of life and death have unfolded on these plains for millions of years. Acres of grassland provide a giant dining table for herds of herbivores. And where hooves tread, Stallion does his best to defend his panicking harem. If his hooves make contact, while some give chase, others stay hidden. An ambush prey that is driven towards them.
Lions are much less cooperative when the kill has been made. Feeding is a free-for-all. A hungry lion can eat a quarter of its own body weight in one sitting. Although cubs will eat meat if they can get it, they seldom get a look-in at a carcass. Fortunately, these are still young enough to fill up on their mother's milk. The scent of carrion carries on the wind and attracts scavengers from miles around. When jackals and vultures have picked all they can from a carcass, hyenas will find something worth eating. The hyena's huge skull and powerful jaw muscles are designed to crush bones. Their strong stomach acid will dissolve them in a matter of hours. They make a good meal of what other scavengers leave behind. The ability to eat solid bone gives hyena mothers an advantage. With so much calcium in their diet, they produce some of the richest milk of all mammals. Back at the den, two hungry mouths eagerly await their mother's return. Hyena pups can be left alone for days while their mother roams the plains, hunting and scavenging. But when she finally comes home, they are treated to a nutritious meal that is well worth the wait. Although they are born with a full set of teeth, most hyena pups aren't weaned until they are over a year old. Females are dominant in hyena society, but there's no sisterhood. High-ranking females threaten a subordinate in full view of the clan's pups. It's a good way for young to learn who stands where in the group's hierarchy. Seeing how their own mother behaves in the group quickly teaches pups what social advantages they may or may not have inherited. Mount Kenya stands sentinel on the horizon. Wildlife living in its shadow is dependent on the supply of water fed down to the plains from the icy peaks. The struggle for survival on the plains is nothing compared to that on the mountain's high slopes. As the mountain climbs skyward, its head and shoulders venture into a different world.
Above 4,400 meters, in the Nival Zone, there is nothing but snow and rock. The air is thin and cold. Weather at these heights is raw and damaging. Moisture freezes and thaws, expanding and contracting in cracks in the rock, slowly breaking it up. But in the Afro-Alpine zone, just below the barren peaks, life has managed to take hold. Temperatures can vary from 30 degrees Celsius when the sun is overhead, to more than 10 degrees below freezing when it dips below the horizon. Up here, it's winter every night and summer every day. Animals and plants here are isolated from the world below, marooned in an ocean of cloud. To survive in this hostile habitat, they must adapt or yield to the mountain. An auger buzzard takes advantage of the mountain's wind patterns. Thermals pushing up the steep slopes lifted high into the sky. These buzzards can survive at higher altitudes than any other bird of prey in Africa. A compact body and large wings are the ideal design for soaring through the mountain's thin air. Auger buzzards can glide effortlessly for hours. Long and flexible primary feathers at the wingtip stretch and rotate for precision maneuverability. Laser-sharp eyesight scours the ground for prey. And there is one animal in particular it's looking for. Rock Hyrax. The Rock Hyrax on Mount Kenya have much thicker coats than their cousins that live at lower altitudes. Dense fur goes some way to help keep them warm in the wintry climate. Baby Hyrax find getting their feet off the ground is a good way to keep the cold out. Young Hyrax get to grips with the slippery rocks very quickly and are able to jump half a meter when they are just two days old. Their rubbery feet secrete sticky sweat that gives them extra traction. And the thick pads act like suction cups to help them cling to steep rocks. While the family are out in the open, the alpha male keeps a sharp eye out for danger. But the auger buzzard's snowy undercarriage is well camouflaged against the misty skies overhead. She's not easy to spot from below. As soon as the alpha male Hyrax sounds the alarm, the family bolt for safety. This time, the buzzard's gone hungry, but she'll be back. This female will be ready to lay a clutch of eggs in a couple of months, so she'll have hungry mouths to feed. She may lay up to three eggs, but usually only the strongest chick will live. The fight for survival begins in the nest.
The buzzards' hunting grounds are a strange world. Up here, even plants have had to evolve bizarre ways to survive. These peculiar groundsels have taken the word hardy to extremes. Giant tree groundsels can grow to be 10 meters high and live for 200 years. Dead leaves are held on the plant and allowed to bunch around the trunk. It's the vegetable answer to wearing a scarf. Cabbage groundsels hunker close to the ground and draw their downy leaves around them as though tucking themselves into bed with a blanket. When the sun drops behind the mountain peaks each evening, the temperature plummets. When a new day breaks, drip feed streams that go on to power rivers on the plains below. It's the vital source of water for everything living at the mountain's feet. A Malachite sunbird seems far too delicate a creature to survive in this harsh climate. But it has a unique relationship with a curious plant that holds the key to its success. Sunbirds need a lot of fuel to fire their tiny engines at this altitude. Hidden among a giant lobelia's whiskers are tiny flowers packed with the richest nectar in the world. The woolly stem provides more than just a meal for a sunbird pair. They use the fluffy leaf hairs to line their nests. Each evening the little birds enter a state of torpor. A miniature hibernation every night. Tribal elders have been known to make pilgrimages up to Mount Kenya's freezing peaks. In their eyes, the journey brought them closer to God. But humans are mere visitors here. No man can survive at this altitude permanently. The Kikuyu people, who historically live around the base of the mountain, call Mount Kenya Kirinyaga the mountain of brightness. Its white peaks have fascinated them since the birth of their tribe. Seen from below, where snow and ice are unheard of, the glinting white ice caps seem nothing short of divine. Kikuyu myth tells of a supreme creator called Ngai. Many Kikuyu people have left their traditional way of life behind. But beliefs and customs are kept alive by a few groups clinging to their tribal history. Snow white patterns drawn on the skin for rituals symbolize the rivers and lands of Ngai's kingdom. Ngai conjured Mount Kenya from the elements as a resting place, and he lives on its bright peaks. But the world is changing. 
the white ice on the peaks is not as striking as it once was. Many Kikuyu see the vanishing glacier as a sign that their god is deserting them. The shining crown of ice that has been the focus of their spiritual beliefs for centuries could disappear in as little as 30 years. The impact on Kikuyu's spirituality would be devastating. But the impact on their physical lives and those of the animals who also depend on the glacier's water would be even more dramatic. The Lycipia Plateau is dry for seven months of the year in two distinct seasons. When the rain stays away, runoff from Mount Kenya's glacier-fed rivers is the plain's only source of water. But plants and animals here have evolved ways of surviving through dry seasons. A whistling thorn acacia tree's tiny leaves help it to survive the dry season, as very little water can evaporate from the small leaf surfaces. But drought isn't the tree's only problem. Acacias are a giraffe's favorite food. Their great height gives giraffe access to leaves far out of reach of other mammals, and adults eat over 30 kilos every day. The tree puts up a fight against this onslaught. Wicked spines stud every branch, making any meal a very prickly affair. But giraffe are made of tough stuff. Their flexible lips are armor-plated, and a prehensile tongue can strip leaves from the thorniest of twigs. They even have syrupy saliva that coats any thorns inadvertently swallowed, protecting the giraffe's long throat. But the acacias have one more weapon in their arsenal. Colonies of ants make their home in the bulbous bases of the thorns. They enjoy a safe place to live among the spikes, out of reach of predatory birds. In return, the ants help the tree fight its herbivorous enemies by biting and squirting acid. But the adult males in this herd have more than food on their minds. A bull giraffe has found a female on heat. He lets her know his intentions by gently nudging her and following her everywhere she goes. This female is not so easily wooed. A serious suitor knows better than to give up too quickly. And he stays close. An amorous male needs eyes in the back of his head. He's not the only one with romantic ideas. A younger male joins in the pursuit. It's a bold move. The two males square up to each other. Assessing one another's strength. Each tries to stand taller than the other. A male giraffe skull gets bigger and more knobbly as it gets older. 
until it's like a great club on the end of its neck. The giraffe swings this weapon backwards, so the horns hit his opponent like a hammer. The full force of the blow is concentrated in one spot. A well-aimed wallop can be powerful enough to knock a giraffe off its feet. This time, the challenger realizes he's met his match and retreats before too much damage can be done. The dominant male's efforts have paid off. The female finally accepts his advances. He may not be the most handsome giraffe on the plains, but his battle scars are a sure sign he's a strong individual, with a good set of genes to pass on. Southwest of the Lycipia Plateau lies an ancient mountain range, the Abadares. These age-old hills once stood at least as tall as their neighbor, Mount Kenya. But their snow-capped peaks have long since eroded away. And their highest point is now only just over 4,000 meters. Twice as old as Mount Kenya, all that is left of the Abadares' once towering summits are granite stumps studding the moorland. They are known as the Dragon's Teeth. After a few more million years battling the elements, Mount Kenya will look something like this. These misty moorlands look more like Scotland than Africa. But the thick vegetation hides some of Africa's icons. These elephants live higher than any others on the continent. Their tusks and skin are red from the mineral-rich volcanic earth. Some of the hardier bulls venture up into the high heather moorlands where the temperature can drop below freezing. They seem out of place in this alpine landscape, but elephants belong here. They have been migrating around Mount Kenya and the Abadares for centuries. Other animals seem more in keeping with the landscape. Waterbuck are impervious to the cold waters of an icy tarn. Their fur is coated with a natural oil that waterproofs the hair. It also gives off a pungent smell, which has the added advantage of keeping predators at bay. Few animals find the stench of a waterbuck appetizing, and they are seldom on the menu.
grassland meadows flourish on the volcanic soils, and Africa's largest lawnmowers thrive. A buffalo's broad incisors and massive molars cut and crush long, coarse grass very efficiently. They move in herds that can number as many as a thousand individuals. Oxpeckers often follow a buffalo herd, taking advantage of the ticks and other parasites they carry. But if the opportunity arises, an oxpecker will feed on the buffalo's blood directly too. Many animals in these African highlands have evolved ways to make the most of their harsh environment. Servals are some of the most agile and efficient hunters in Africa. Their long legs help them pick their way through the moorland tussocks. Relative to their body size, servals have the longest legs of any cat, helping keep their heads and crucially their ears above long grass. Their huge ears channel the slightest of sounds so they can pinpoint prey hidden in the undergrowth. They can even hear prey burrowing underground. They pounce with such force that they often kill their quarry on impact. And they can leap three meters up into the air to snatch birds in flight. Usually their coats are spotted. Perfect camouflage for those that live on grassy plains. But up here in the Abadeas, many servals are pure black. This mountain population is cut off from the world below. A rare gene that causes melanism or dark pigmentation has spread among the servals here. A black coat that absorbs heat is a useful adaptation to life in this cold environment. There are few other predators to compete with, so camouflage is no longer so crucial. The Abadeas boast some of Africa's greenest hills. Below the moors, Waterfalls spill into wooded ravines. This forest, like that found on Mount Kenya's low slopes, is a rich wildlife habitat. Here, black and white colobus monkeys spend all their time in the treetops. Tree moss has very little nutritional value, but a colobus monkey has a massive stomach and can pack in so much, it's a meal worth having. Colobus monkeys conserve energy by using flexible tree branches as springboards to propel them through the canopy. Their billowing coats act like a parachute, creating drag and helping to keep their daredevil leaps under control. Their acrobatics are all the more impressive because this species has no thumbs. Their fingers curl around branches like hooks, making it easy to swing through the trees.
Colobus babies are born with pure white fur and don't get their distinctive black and white pattern till they are three months old. It's an evolutionary trick that triggers behavior known as aunting. A snow white newborn is a subject of fascination in the troop. Colobus monkey females live in tight knit groups and the whole family take turns holding the baby. It's a way for the troop females to bond with their new cousin and it gives the mother a break so she can feed. But one careless grab and the little monkey could suffer a fatal fall. The wet cloud forest environment of the mountain slopes is a stark contrast to the savanna grasslands of the Lycipia Plateau. Here, the tall forest trees are replaced with scrubby acacia brush. Hardly the place for a monkey. But patas monkeys have made this world their own. Patas monkeys are built for speed rather than climbing. Slim bodies and long legs are much more suited to moving across the ground than for swinging through a forest canopy. Their elongated front legs give them a huge stride for their size and allow them to reach top speeds of 55 kilometers an hour. They are the fastest primates in the world. But there is one animal on the savanna that can run twice as fast as they can. Just as animals on Mount Kenya's slopes have adapted to their cold mountain habitat, cheetahs are perfectly adapted for life on the parched plains. A flexible spine allows them to cover as much ground as a racehorse in each stride, over six meters. They can sprint over 110 kilometers an hour. The broad tail works like a rudder, helping it keep its balance as it zigzags after bolting prey. Their lightweight build is ideal for chasing down the quickest of antelopes. Cheetahs bring down prey using their dew claw, a sharp hook high on their front paws. But in return for speed, Cheetahs have had to sacrifice the weapons they could use to protect themselves. Their claws are blunt, built for traction rather than laceration. Their canine teeth are small, leaving plenty of space in the skull for a large nasal passage. This lets the cheetah take in lots of oxygen when it's recovering after a sprint. Not built to fight, adult cheetahs are usually solitary. Their cryptic markings help them keep a low profile. They avoid confrontations with other cheetahs, but keep in touch with other individuals through smell. This lone tree is an established scent post. It's a feline message board where every cheetah in the area can leave an aromatic status update. A male can tell if there's a receptive female around. 
or whether he is encroaching on a territorial male's patch. Cheetah get all the moisture they need by drinking the blood, and even urine, of their prey. Some animals on the savanna need much more water to survive. Elephants here face very different challenges to those in the forested foothills and cold moors. African elephants eat up to 300 kilos of vegetation every day and drink 190 liters of water. As the dry season takes hold, their constant search for food and water takes them further and further afield. They can travel up to 30 kilometers each day. The herd is led by a matriarch, the oldest female in the group, whose knowledge of water sources and feeding places has been passed down through generations. Young elephants have a very long childhood and don't become sexually mature until they are well into their teens. They don't have the innate survival instincts of many other animals on the plains, but learn their life skills from the adults in the herd. Elephant mothers make sure their offspring know the ancient migration routes that crisscross the plateau. It's crucial to their survival. But not every animal is able to cope with the dry season. Scavengers keep a sharp eye out for any signs of weakness and are quick to react when an animal succumbs to the tough conditions. White-backed vultures work as a mob, dominating a carcass by sheer force of numbers. But even they are put in their place when the lappet-faced vultures arrive. Lappet-faced are the largest vultures on the African savanna, with a wingspan of three meters. Their powerful beaks can rip open the toughest hide and tear through tendons. One pair can strip a small antelope to the bone in just 20 minutes. Bare heads mean their feathers don't get covered in blood as they dig into a carcass. But these formidable birds have a softer side. They mate for life and will raise one chick every couple of years together for 40 or 50 years. Kenya's climate is becoming unpredictable. Dry seasons are stretching into droughts. Animals and people are becoming more reliant than ever on the water supply fed down from Mount Kenya. Traditionally, the Kikuyu believe that their god Ngai, who lives on the mountain, controls all aspects of the natural world. Drought is seen as a sign that Ngai is displeased with his people. In 2009, some areas saw not a drop of rain for nearly a year. And when the rains finally broke, the ground was too hard for the water to soak in. Instead of revitalizing pasture, 
Torrential rain eroded the parched earth away. The rain provides some relief, but such violent storms can do more harm than good. To the Kikuyu people, such damaging weather conditions are a sure sign their god is angry. A clap of thunder is thought to be the sound of the great god's joints cracking as he moves. As the glaciers dwindle, Mount Kenya's brightness is dimming. Many Kikuyu fear God may be preparing to leave them forever. Elders meet to discuss what they can have done to offend the great God and what they can do to appease him. Beer brewed from honey and sugar cane is poured on the fire to invoke the spirits of the ancestors. The dead are still considered to be active members of the tribe, and their help is needed in times of crisis. Drastic measures are needed to pacify their god and guy, and persuade him to stay and watch over his people. Legend has it that the first Kikuyu man sacrificed a goat under a fig tree and begged Ngai to send husbands for his many daughters. Ever since, the Kikuyu have regarded the sacrifice of a goat as the most precious gift they can offer their god. Magumu fig trees are still sacred in Kikuyu eyes and symbolize Mount Kenya. The goat's intestines are laid at the foot of the tree and its blood sprinkled on the trunk. The tree is a natural altar, a place where the people feel a deep connection to their god. The remainder of the sacrificial goat is roasted and shared among the clan. Ritual dancing around a ceremonial fire continues late into the night. The atmosphere is alive with the spirits of the ancestors. The Kikuyu celebrate their creator Ngai who lives on the peaks of Mount Kenya just as they have for centuries. Mount Kenya is one of the natural wonders of Africa. It's an iconic landmark, a unique habitat, a sacred house of God, a natural water tower, Animals and plants have evolved over countless generations to survive on the high slopes. Cloud forest shelters canopy specialists and intrepid giants. And for hundreds of years, people have seen its shining summits as a throne of God. But Mount Kenya faces change. The ice caps, that for thousands of years have stored water high on the peaks and released it to nourish the wildlife and people below are shrinking. The fates of these glaciers and the Kikuyu people go hand in hand. If the ice disappears, the core of their culture will be nothing but a memory. But just as animals and plants have evolved, to survive on the mountain's snow-capped peaks, so life will adapt to survive without them in the future. Mount Kenya stands guard, rising above the plains and forests at its feet. The great mountain will dominate the landscape here for years and millennia to come.
with or without its glaciers.